You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. Episode 19, Not Playing to Win. This is the third of a three-episode arc examining the role of toys, fairy tales, and games in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. If you missed episodes 17 and or 18, you should go back before proceeding. In this episode, I'll talk about Harry the anti-warrior, the non-gamer. Paradoxically, as a hero who constantly plays games and plays them well, sometimes the most interesting thing about Harry is when he either refuses to play or he plays, but he doesn't play to win. In Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, when Harry returns to the Gryffindor common room after his name comes out of the goblet, the celebration in his honor rivals the most raucous post-Quidditch party. Just as we only heard about Hogwarts students who were Quidditch players putting their name in the goblet, Quidditch also unites the first people who congratulate him, Fred, George, Angelina, and Katie, plus Lee Jordan, the Quidditch commentator. Despite the lack of literal Quidditch after the World Cup, brooms make frequent appearances as metaphorical weapons in Goblet of Fire. When Rita Skeeter pulls Harry aside for a private interview, the confrontational nature of this is highlighted by its taking place in a broom cupboard, a metaphorical armory. Harry compares his nerves before the first task to the nerves he experiences before a Quidditch match. Brooms and flying come up again when Barty Crouch Jr., disguised as Mad-Eye Moody, asks Harry what he's best at. Harry's instinctive answer is Quidditch, a metaphorical war. In the first task, the champions must get past dragons. The Quidditch similarities are heightened because they're each required to catch a golden egg, a virtual golden snitch, and it specifically resembles the snitch Harry inherits from Dumbledore because it opens to reveal a secret. Harry, of course, is best at this task. He summons his broom and swoops down on the egg as he would a golden snitch during a Quidditch match, getting it from his dragon more quickly than the other champions. He often considers his broom to be a weapon, and the first task of the tournament reinforces this. Later, when Harry is working out the clue to the task aligned with the element of water, the hostages in the lake, after holding the egg under water to hear the clue, he has a dream in which the mermaid in the painting in the prefect's bath holds his broom over his head, taunting him. In this dream, his weapon is withheld from him because he doesn't have what he needs to accomplish this task. Harry's innate power sharing comes to the surface when Hagrid shows him the dragons they'll all be facing. Ever the fair fighter, Harry knows Victor and Fleur will learn about the dragons from their head teachers, so he must tell Cedric to guarantee a level playing field for all of them. Harry wouldn't mind winning the tournament, but not unfairly, just as Cedric felt that he had an unfair advantage during the Quidditch match in the previous book when Harry fell off his broom. Harry, Ron, and Hermione each react negatively to a champion based upon romantic jealousy. Harry reacts negatively to Cho going to the ball with Cedric. Ron reacts negatively to Hermione going to the ball with Victor. And Hermione reacts negatively when she hears that Ron has asked Fleur to the ball, and later when Fleur kisses Ron on the cheek after he helps get her little sister out of the lake. Hermione is Victor's hostage, and Cho Chang is Cedric's. Ron is Harry's hostage, serving as a surrogate for his sister Ginny as the thing Harry would miss most now. Ginny later swaps places with Ron and becomes Harry's best source of comfort. The other male champions are each rescuing the girls they care most about, while Harry rescues a stand-in for the girl he eventually cares about. Fleur's hostage is her sister, not a romantic partner or a surrogate for one. Gabrielle Delacour is the only hostage to whom Harry has no emotional attachments, unlike Cho, the girl he fancies, and Ron and Hermione, his best friends. But he still feels compelled to rescue her with the others. He again shares power, regardless of whether this will hurt his chances of success. Making sure the hostages are all safe is more important to him than winning. He's convinced that the mock war has turned real, and when it's revealed that he attempted to save them all, he gets high marks for this. 
He's the story's chief soldier, yet he's consistently depicted as an anti-warrior who doesn't strive for victory at any cost. The choice of hostages is yet another way, besides the Yule Ball, that Rowling enmeshes romance into the competition. The game is one of both love and war. The pairing of each member of the trio with a champion of whom they are jealous points to this. We also get a trio and counter trio scenario that foreshadows the trio and counter trio in the next book. Here the counter trio is Cedric, Victor, and Fleur. These three are parallel to Neville, Ginny, and Luna, who were Harry's, Ron's, and Hermione's doppelgangers, respectively, in the fifth book, which I talked about in episode 7, Fountain of Youth. Cedric, the champion Harry is jealous of, is equal to Neville, Harry's doppelganger in the fifth book's counter trio. Cedric is a Hufflepuff, and Professor Sprout, his head of house, is the herbology teacher, the job Neville will eventually hold as an adult. Neville and Cedric also both embody the archetype of the father. Victor Crumb, the champion Ron is jealous of, fills the same role in his counter trio as Ginny, Ron's doppelganger, serves in hers, because in Order of the Phoenix, during her first match as a seeker for Gryffindor, Ginny does exactly what Victor Crumb does in the World Cup final. She catches the snitch, knowing that doing so secures a victory for the other team, as she does this as an act of mercy to end an excruciating game for her brother, Ron. J.K. Rowling has said that Ginny becomes a professional Quidditch player later, like Victor Crumb. Ron and Victor are also both wise old men. Fleur, the champion Hermione is jealous of, fills the same role in her counter trio as Luna Lovegood, Hermione's doppelganger, does in hers. Luna is the anti-Hermione, a doppelganger for her with inverted versions of many of Hermione's attributes. Luna is also fascinated by Ron for a little while in the fifth book, hanging on his every word and laughing uproariously at every little thing he says, plus displaying detailed knowledge of his limited dating history. There is also a superficial physical resemblance between Luna and Fleur, both blondes with light-colored eyes, and one is an actual Ravenclaw, while the other is a virtual Ravenclaw. And finally, Fleur, Hermione, and Luna create yet another maiden mother crone triad. Harry considers Cedric his rival in the tournament and for Cho, but Victor thinks Harry is his rival for Hermione's affections, completely missing that he fancies the other male champion's girlfriend. This isn't just a competition for the tournament cup. They're competing for love, which completes us, makes us whole. Ron treats the Ubal as a real, not metaphorical war, saying that Hermione is, quote, fraternizing with the enemy, despite his previously hero-worshipping crumb, including buying a small replica of the Bulgarian Seeker at the Quidditch World Cup, which sounds like a kind of wizard action figure. A toy, in other words. This figure is later found maimed in Ron's dormitory. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to work like a voodoo doll, and Victor suffers no physical injury after Ron, presumably, vents his feelings on it. The location of the final task is another sign of the tournament being the metaphorical war replacing Quidditch in the fourth book, since it takes place in a maze on the Quidditch pitch. If Harry or other students really thought about it, they probably wouldn't have decided that it was logical to have no Quidditch for an entire year, since there are only three tournament tasks, four when you count the Yule Ball, and most students aren't participating. There are usually six Quidditch matches over the course of about eight months. However, the tournament serves functionally as a replacement for Quidditch in the book's plot, so whether this makes sense to the students isn't a consideration for Rowling. Quidditch is the chief metaphorical war in which Harry usually fights. Two prominent mock wars, both fought by Harry, would make the plot too crowded. It makes sense on a meta level for him to be attacked during the final tournament task, but this means that the Quidditch matches in which he might have played would also have to be related to genuine war, and Rowling doesn't seem to want the two activities competing. But even with two champions who are on their house teams, there's still no really good reason for the rest of the school not to have a Quidditch season. Harry and Cedric could be excluded from Quidditch for one year to let them concentrate on the tournament, and other students could play their positions. But no, if Harry isn't going to war during Quidditch, if it's included just for sport, 
that doesn't fit her pattern. As the final task approaches, Rowling writes, The start of the summer term would normally have meant that Harry was training hard for the last Quidditch match of the season. This year, however, it was the third and final task in the Triwizard Tournament for which he needed to prepare. She links the year's last match and the last task, a comparison heightened by the sight of the task. As I mentioned in the previous episode, the maze being grown on the pitch points to this task aligning with the element of Earth, and the center of the maze is a metaphorical home, the champion's goal. This was usual for a medieval labyrinth, which is shaped like a circle and cross game board, which in turn looks like a common symbol for the Earth. On top of this, when Cedric, a Hufflepuff, the house aligned with the element of Earth, and Harry take the cup together, they're transported to a graveyard. Earth to Earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Ludo Bagman shows the hedge maze to the champions in its early stages and says that they'll have to get past obstacles in the maze. This is followed by Victor asking Harry about his relationship with Hermione, which Victor is relieved to learn is platonic. Right afterward, they see Barty Crouch Sr., a virtual prisoner of war who's escaped his house, no longer under the imperious curse his son placed on him. But Crouch isn't quite in full possession of his faculties when they meet him on the school grounds. By the time Harry fetches Dumbledore, Crouch is gone and Crumb is on the ground, stunned. Moody, really Barty Crouch Jr., volunteers to find Crouch Sr., his own father, so he can kill him before his father can talk. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are mystified about why Harry wasn't attacked, and Victor was attacked. They have no explanation, just as there's no explanation for Harry not being attacked earlier in the school year. But we do know why. This isn't a game, the type of venue in which Harry must always be attacked. The failure of Barty Crouch Jr. to abduct Harry and take him to Voldemort on the 1st of September could be seen as a huge plot hole, since no reason is given in this or subsequent books for why Voldemort waited until June. But the meta-reason is that this is the author's modus operandi. Mock wars must wharf into real wars. Another construct will not do. Through his scar, Harry sees Voldemort torture Wormtail. He finds Fudge and the fake Moody with Dumbledore in the headmaster's office. They leave, and while Harry waits for Dumbledore to return, he enters the Ponceve belonging to the headmaster, a bowl of liquid memories that lets him see past events that Dumbledore has been mulling over. In more than one memory, he sees an arena-like courtroom, a place of confrontation resembling a venue for games, foreshadowing his being in the same arena in the next book, when he's charged with conjuring a Patronus to protect himself and his cousin Dudley from Dementors. However, Harry still has an arena to deal with in the present. One of the obstacles in the maze is a Sphinx. Oedipus also met a Sphinx and had to answer its riddle. What is the creature that walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three in the evening? Oedipus gives the correct answer, man, because a baby crawls on all fours, then learns to walk upright, and finally must walk with the help of a stick as an elderly person. That's the third leg. The riddle that the Sphinx in the maze asks Harry to solve has spider for its answer, but the first part of the riddle produces the word spy. This is soon after Harry sees Dumbledore refer to Snape as a spy in the Ponceve. Harry sees a giant spider, an Acromantula, about to attack Cedric. Unlike the last time Harry went up against giant spiders, he's not saved by the Fort Anglia, living wild in the forest as a woods car, the deus ex machina savior that rescued Harry and Ron from the spiders in Chamber of Secrets. Instead, when Harry trips and drops his wand while the spider bears down on him, Harry distracts it by throwing spells at it. So it attacks Harry, lifting him into the air until he finds a spell that works on the spider, his signature move, Expelliarmus, which makes the spider drop him. The fall from around 12 feet makes Harry's previously injured leg even worse, so after he and Cedric succeed in stunning the spider by aiming at its soft underbelly, he's unable to run to the cup. He tells Cedric to take it, but Cedric tells Harry to take it, since he saved Cedric twice in the maze. They disagree, and both refuse to take it. Finally, Harry suggests that they take it together, and this appeals to Cedric's innate fairness and power sharing. Because of Harry's leg, as they walk to the cup, Cedric serves as a walking stick for him. 
just like in the riddle that Oedipus solved. However, the moment they take the cup together, Harry and Cedric are plunged from metaphorical war, though a dangerous one, into a real war. And soon after they arrive in the graveyard in Little Hangleton, Cedric is dead. Games don't disappear once Harry is plunged into a real war, dueling with Voldemort. After Voldemort regains his body and gathers his Death Eaters, he prefers to confront Harry alone. The Death Eaters create a circle around them, an impromptu arena. A similar arena is created around them during their duel in the seventh book. Harry is bound to a tombstone by Voldemort, a symbolic crucifixion. When he's released, the battle with Voldemort takes on the characteristics of a game, not surprisingly. Rowling writes, Voldemort raised his wand, but this time Harry was ready. With the reflexes born of his Quidditch training, he flung himself sideways onto the ground. He rolled behind the marble headstone of Voldemort's father, and he heard it crack as the curse missed him. We're not playing hide and seek, Harry, said Voldemort's soft, cold voice. Harry links his reflexes to Quidditch, the mock war in which he is a stellar fighter, while Voldemort compares it to hide-and-seek, a children's game Harry is reminded of in the seventh book when Voldemort is waiting for him in the forest. Harry decides that he's no longer playing games. He'll stand and die like his father, the archetype that rules this book. This foreshadows his decision to throw off his invisibility cloak in the last book, presenting himself to be killed. What gives Harry a victory here is shared power, Fox's power. Harry and Voldemort each have a feather from Fox the Phoenix in their wands. As though the feathers miss being together united, the spells they cast cause the wands to link. The wands are metaphorically entangled, and the resulting cage of light resonates with Phoenix Song, giving Harry hope, and evoking the god figure, Dumbledore, Fox's owner, just as Fox was Dumbledore's agent, a symbolic holy spirit, in the Chamber of Secrets, which I talked about in episode 13, Deus Ex Machina. The wands link because no one disarms Harry. When he arrived in the graveyard, his scar hurt him and, quote, his wand slipped from his fingers. When Wormtail returns Harry's wand, he is still its master. Voldemort doesn't think about the wand game rules, so this is a missed opportunity. Harry's will probably couldn't have prevailed over Voldemort's if he were not master of his wand. This also leads Harry's wand to consider Voldemort an enemy, so it acts on its own against him in the final book, when he leaves Privet Drive. The ghostly shades emerging from Voldemort's wand are a reprise of the archetypal wise old man, this time it's Frank Bryce, the father, James and Cedric, both archetypal fathers, and the mother, Lily, the archetypes that accompany Harry at significant times in his life. The images distract Voldemort and the Death Eaters, foreshadowing Harry's loved ones being an honor guard for him when he willingly walks to his death. The phenomenon with the Phoenix Feather Wands also foreshadows the Elder Wand's refusal, entangled with Harry as it is, to act contrary to his will, just as Brother Wands will refuse to fight each other. Harry will play the wand game with Voldemort twice more and win each time, the last time for good. But that last time he will once again triumph with his signature move, the disarming charm, the spell of an anti-warrior. <laughs> game-like obstacle Harry encounters on the way to the Philosopher's Stone is a three-headed Cerberus-like dog that is guardian of an underworld, evoking the symbolic death that's necessary before achieving immortality through the Philosopher's Stone. The second obstacle is Devil's Snare, a deadly plant that evokes the snakes, literal and figurative, of the second book. It also requires sunlight and an act of faith to conquer, which is how Harry conquers the basilisk, through his statement of faith in Dumbledore, which brings Fox the Phoenix to him, bearing the sorting hat with the sword of Gryffindor. The third obstacle, the flying keys, is like practice for a seeker, and this obstacle aligns with the one book built around literal Quidditch. It also involves a quest for a key that recalls Harry freeing Sirius and Buckbeak. 
The fourth obstacle to the Philosopher's Stone is the life-sized chess game, a literal game and a literal battle, rather than a battle that resembles a game. This involves all three of the friends in the trio, though Ron decides the moves for Harry's side. He sacrifices himself to achieve victory, but since Harry and Hermione are players as well, they're also potentially at risk. No one is safe. Professor McGonagall provides this obstacle. She teaches transfiguration, a theological term referring to a manifestation of God. In the chess game, Harry is in the role of a bishop, a link between heaven and earth, as Jesus is considered to be at the moment of his transfiguration. McGonagall is also the only female character embodying the father archetype, which rules the book that is built around the Triwizard Tournament, a life-sized board game. This is foreshadowed by the first book's life-sized chess game. The chess game parallels the tournament in many ways. Harry is equal to himself, for obvious reasons. That he goes to a place of death, a graveyard, but returns, is reflected in his role as a bishop, a position of heavenly, not earthly power, a liminal being who crosses thresholds, who can cross over into the world of death and return. This is where the earlier comparison of the two counter trios from the fourth and fifth books comes in handy again. Neville, a combination of Gryffindor and Hufflepuff, is not technically in the chess game, but he and Cedric correspond to each other in the two counter trios, since Cedric is a Hufflepuff and they embody the same archetype, the father. When Hermione puts a full body bind on Neville, an interesting choice of spell, this makes him similar to a corpse with rigor mortis, while Cedric becomes a real corpse. Cedric is also the one who does not survive the tournament, while in the first book, Neville, his representative, doesn't even get started. He stays in the Gryffindor common room, immobile, while Harry, Ron, and Hermione go to protect the Philosopher's Stone. There's even a parallel between Neville and Cedric at the ends of the first and fourth books, when Dumbledore toasts to each of them during the leaving feast, though he is rewarding Neville for standing up to his friends, as Dumbledore stood up to Grindelwald, and he is memorializing Cedric. Hermione is at a disadvantage at chess, just as Fleur does not perform impressively in the tournament despite being her school's champion. In the counter trio of the fourth book, Hermione's doppelganger is Fleur, while Luna is her doppelganger in the fifth book's counter trio. Luna's link to chess is that in the seventh book, Ron calls the Lovegood house a rook, another name for the castle in chess. This is the role that Hermione plays during the chess game. Ron is again linked to Victor Crumb, both of them archetypal wise old men. In the fourth book, Victor makes a sacrifice in the Quidditch World Cup that helps others. Ginny is Victor's equal in the fifth book's counter trio and Ron's doppelganger, and she makes the same sort of sacrifice that Victor does in the World Cup the first time she plays Seeker in place of Harry. She makes this sacrifice largely for Ron's benefit. Thus, Ron's sacrifice in the chess game foreshadows Victor's World Cup choice and Ginny's later choice. In other words, in the chess game that foreshadows the World Cup and the tournament with the labyrinthine maze whose center must be reached as if the champions are on a giant Ludo or Parcheesi board, both of which are based on an ancient game board that looks like a symbol for Earth or the world, Ron's sacrifice helps Harry to move forward, making the chess game a clever summation of the fourth book, in which the Triwizard Tournament is a life-sized circle and cross game instead of a chess game. In the chess game, at the beginning of the series, Harry sees an example of the type of sacrifice Victor makes at the World Cup, and the type of sacrifice Ginny, his partner and equal, will also make before Harry, the anti-warrior, makes the ultimate sacrifice, laying down his life to defeat Voldemort. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B. L. Purdom. Whether you are streaming on iTunes, Stitcher, CastBox, or another podcatcher, please leave a rating and or a comment, and share episodes of Quantum Harry with your friends. Next time on Quantum Harry, episode 20, The Order of the Rebel. 
the beginning of a three-episode arc examining the role of toys, sweets, and games in Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, chiefly examining how J.K. Rowling enmeshed her version of an historical event into this book, an event that is commemorated annually by a holiday featuring bonfires, fireworks, and adults getting to behave like children. I hope you'll join me. Thank you.